Welcome everyone to Political Paradigm. I'm Terry Ikumi. It's back to school season and uh, parents are groaning. There are concerns as to what seems like rumors around increase in school fees. And then there are also concerns around government policies that are being called to question. So in the last one here, let's take a look at the education sector and see how it's fared on the, the Tinubu administration, especially since the ministers are marking one year in office. Uh, there are two ministers in the education uh, sector now. So let's talk to one of them. My guest is the Honorable Minister of State for Education, Honorable Minister Yusuf Tanko Sununu. Welcome to Political Prada. Thank you, Mr. Terry, for having me. I think I spoke with you just uh, when you assumed office to get your understanding of the ministry you were about to take over. And uh, as I said in my opening, there are two ministers now to address some of the concerns that Nigerians experienced when we had a minister in there for eight years and almost a total decay in the education sector. So as you mark one year in office, I'd like to get your assessment of how you think the ministry has fared in the past one year, especially with regard to government policies. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me, as I said earlier. Well, in the last one year, we have had a lot of uh, issues addressed and there are some ongoing works for so many challenges in the sector. One education is one of the largest sectors in the country, and it's not surprising because it's the basic bedrock for national development, for unity, cohesion, for region, local and regional uh, integrations. These are all the issues that are addressed by our national policy on uh, education. Uh, when we came, we met a ministry with uh, so many laudable programs, but there are some uh, implementation issues with so many gaps. Uh, with uh, multiple duplications in many different uh, departments. But uh, luckily for us, we are given a matching order by Mr. President uh, through the Ministerial Deliberable, which we have signed, and uh, also along with the eight-point agenda of Mr. President that covers all the uh, collaborative effort within the eight-point agenda of Mr. President, and we're also guided by the National Police on Education. As I mentioned earlier, briefing gaps that we have tried to see how we can address those issues. Basically, I would say that uh, if you look at issues, uh, you say, what are the issues and where are the... If you look at, we made actually there are some pillars, infrastructure, as you mentioned earlier, there are some decays. And in the last one year, uh, we have tried to do more in terms of school renovations and also construction. Uh, but also you should know that uh, what makes education a very difficult environment is the nature of education being con in the concurrent list with so many responsibilities in, at lower level of government in the uh, let's say the local government and also state government with national being major input in terms of uh, developing policy, supervising and assuring quality uh, uh, assurance and then uh, track, uh, tracking and developing the progress of where we are. So these are this because of that concurrent nature. But in our own supportive actions, we have tried to see with this position Agencies that are to do with a lot in terms of uh, our infrastructural development. Uh, the issue of the universal basic education is very vital. And uh, as much as possible, we try to ensure that uh, so much is now in invested into education. Uh, with major achievement there is the alignment we have achieved between the uh, state and the federal government. Mm. When we came into office, so many states have a lot of fun lying follow with universal basic education because of their failure to pay their matching grants. And this, as of today, virtually all the same are accessing their uh, matching grant. They are paying their matching grant and accessing the fund, uh, putting it into uh, infrastructural development in Bureau State. And we have also tried to strategize and improving our inspect uh, inspection function through the universal basic education to ensure that money for Balu. Mm. And that's, uh, we, 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 we have also appreciated that. Even at, at the level of basic education, uh, secondary school education, there are a serious gap in terms of funding. But because of Mr. President's commitment to education, uh, we have this for the first time, the National Secondary School Service Commission has received uh, a massive one of about 50, nearly 50 billion as a capital project. And as of today, all the procurement processes have been done and uh, contractors have been mobilized to site so that they can improve as a support to their state. And this is spread across the whole uh, federation in their addition. A level of education, top of also infrastructure. Pardon me to say that we have already commissioned 53 basic 
vocational education schools, which have also been handed over to school and they are this, they are working. We have also tried to see how we can improve on our teacher crisis by going into partnership. Currently, we have a partnership with the UNESCO IGBA to see how we can train and retrain teacher in terms of deploying technology into teaching profession. And to go along with, we have strengthened the uh, understanding between Koika of Japan and the universal basic education to the extent that uh, the installations, uh, building installation training of trainers has been completed to ensure that our digital resource center at Kado is being, uh, is, is made functional. And as of today, it's, uh, it started training and it has also been linked to many smart schools that have so far been, uh, constructed in the addition. We also tried to see how we can, uh, review the issue of funding at tertiary level. Uh, the third fund, is living up to its expectations. And uh, at, at now, we have uh, uh, the third fund has been directed to focus more explicitly in terms of the activating our workshop mm. and then imp imputing into our uh, the deployment more instrument that will ensure that we have given the necessary uh, skills to students who are in training. And uh, we also give them much, uh, a lot of our decision has been now paid to reorganize its committee so that research and research grant utilization can also be effectively uh, maintained. And then if you go to most of our tertiary institutions, you also see that infrastructural development. And another major pillar is the curriculum. It's, uh, when we came in, it is, uh, it is good enough to know that for the past 40 years, our curriculum has not been rebuilt. And you and I believe, and everybody will believe that, Anything that has lasted for 40 years is out of tune with current reality in terms of a uh, need for, for AI technology and so many issues that will make in, uh, our country or our students stand the test of time and be useful in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And as of today, we have completed uh, a review of our curriculum in trades and uh, it has already uh, been uh, distributed. And for basic education and secondary schools uh, in our country, the the review of the curriculum and uh, has also been completed. We are just going to, in this December and September, we are going to have National Council of Education in Abuja in yeah. the next few days to come, and that will be presented okay. for adoption and then for utilization. It goes ahead to address a lot of our needs of current uh, reality, which is a very big uh, success in terms of uh, everybody mm -hmm. was complaining about our curriculum on which we have succeeded in, the, okay. in review. All right, so uh, you've said quite a lot, and I want to take you up on some of them. Yes. Because I know that this year the president approved this uh, national education data system and also talked about the need for vocational training, which you've talked about. You've mentioned about 53 vocational uh, institutions. institutions. Perhaps you could be a little more detailed on them and the extent of their success so far. Well, uh, what the president uh, approved for us is a whole lot of projects <clears throat> put in a single word, dot. That is D-O-T-S. The D, which you have rightly mentioned, stands for the data repository. And uh, you know that uh, data is very vital in terms of planning, resources allocation, tracking even progress of what you have achieved. And this is actually lacking. For so many examples, for example, now we have a lot of data in terms of out-of-school children, in terms of infrastructure. But different bodies will give you different data as a time. So as of today, now we, have, uh, we are concluding that arrangement and very soon in the next few days, the enumeration will start. Enumerators will go around and we'll get data of all our schools, data of our teachers, data of our inf uh, of infrastructure at level, so that we know how many percentage of our students are out of school, how many of them age 18 to 35 are in university, how many of them, and then in your own room, you will be able to, uh, if a major stakeholder, to track using a dashboard the progress of each and every student. And this one we are working together with other agencies of government so that we can have a holistic approach. And that is this, in the out of school children phenomenon, we'll all agree that it's a major issue in Nigeria <coughs> and it is features as a major thematic area in the eight point agenda of Mr. President. And uh, in that regard, we are working hard and we have been given mandate as a ministry in our last audit for the one year, we have succeeded in returning over 4 million students back to school what we are now we're bottling with and we are working hard is to see what is, our, is going to be our retention rate of those 4 million that we have uh, so far returned back to school and then in addition to those that we are also going to bring back to school and then what will also be their completion rate because there are so many factors but luckily okay. for us the currently now you know that major issue that is challenging our progress as well as addressing the issue of out of school children 
is concerned is issue of insecurity in the country. Mm. And you all believe that in the last uh, uh, 10 days to say, for example, right. we have seen a lot of massive effort so, so, our security agencies to address the issue of insecurity. So and that, once that is achieved, more students will be, less students will be displaced from their school and a lot of those that are going to be returned back to school will be able to remain in school and read, write, and uh, take lessons fiscally. So, so the issue of insecurity is yes. where I wanted to take my cue from to find out how you have been able to return 4 million people, uh, children back to school uh, and in what regions of the country? The 10 million that were, uh, 4 million that were returned is a nationwide. We have a nationwide uh, campaign that I personally also went to different states. With Misa also went to a different state and it, was, and it has a national outlook and we have gone around to ensure that we sensitize state government. We also sensitize the uh, state universal basic education board, which we are doing with them uh, this, uh, to ensure that those students are returned. And we fiscally supervise their uh, addition. And uh, are the incentives to get them back to school? Did you have to uh, employ incentives to get them back to school apart from the appeal? No, it's not that we, we have, uh, we have incentive quite all right. Okay. You know, we are working together with, uh, state universal basic education. And we have a fund line that we use to return students back to school, mm -hmm. which will also address also the issue of teacher training within the, within the fund. But what we are looking now is uh, the effort by the federal government to see how it can organize the school feeding program. And I think once that is completed, that will also give us more added advantage so that more students, because not only in Nigeria, even outside, studies have shown that uh, introduction of one meal per day per student has gone ahead to improve a lot of our school retention and school enrollment rate in schools. And uh, the federal government is seriously working. So why that. was that not effective? Do you, I, mean, I know you are just one year in and you're trying to reintroduce it. No, you, no, did, did you, to re-strategize it. Yeah, to, to re-strategize it. Yes, but how it, so that was it not, more effective. That was not impactful when it was introduced in the last administration. So what exactly are you doing differently? What we are doing now, we are trying to see uh, the, 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 the other issue initially uh, the committee is working to see how it can be returned back to education. Mm. And once that is into education, it shows, uh, we are in direct contact with students and we can be able to assess the progress and also the challenges so that it can be uh, this. And then, uh, as of today, the committee are almost rounding up their, uh, their, their, their assignment to come out with a formidable way of achieving uh, effectivity in terms of school feeding programs. You know, the state of um, public schools is deplorable. And that's uh, so. When you talk about getting returning them back to school and retaining them in school, that's also another challenge because I think that is why uh, most uh, private schools are now thriving. So, with regard to budgeting to address the issue of infrastructure, because you recall that most of the strikes are held in the past uh, maybe ten years or there, but were mainly uh, due to infrastructure deficits in our public schools. So, what exactly is the budgeting plan to introduce? Uh, to improve infrastructure in public schools. Yes, uh, it's, it's what I said earlier. We have to we have to thank the president. We are working on his political will and the campaign promises to improve budgeting and uh, cash allocation to federal ministry of edu uh, to education in general. And Mr. President has really demonstrated that in the 2024 budget, apart from security, which covers virtually everything, you have to secure your school before you can even go and uh, this. Although we agree that at no circumstances education must continue, but you must get sure that since the country is secured for us, Nigeria comes, uh, sorry, education comes next to the security in terms of cash, uh, budgetary allocation. And, uh, to be, uh, faithful to his, uh, uh, commitment, Mr. President has also ensured, a uh, steady release of funds as far as the budget is concerned, mm -hmm. which will allow us to liberate more. And that's why I told you earlier that we have concluded the National Secondary School Service Commission that hitherto has not received a penny, has received and is now mobilizing uh, to almost all the state of the federation for infrastructure, infrastructural support in government-owned schools. You understand? And I also tell you how effective the uh, this year's are. Uh, if you look at our uh, this year, Ted Fund has never received funding as it has received this year. And then so also in terms of the universal basic education. And if you look at, look at also the incentive and initiative of Mr. President, the NEL fund, which has also infused more pass, massive uh, fund into education so that you can increase access to tertiary level of education. There are other series uh, of ideas where money is also come. But are there monitoring, monitoring mechanisms? Because it is one thing, one thing for 
these uh, allocations to be released is another thing to have it implemented. Like you mentioned, tent, tent fund. I think the bureaucracy in tent fund has largely affected it. We have could, you've had uh, uh, institutions complain about accessing those funds. No, no, no. You see, it's not accessing. Tent fund has a criteria. Where is it? It's meeting the criteria of what and how you are going to spend that money on. It's the major issue. And then one, two, we must also know that the number in terms of a uh, number of schools that are accessing TED for now has almost tripled rather than how it used to be before. And then let me tell you what, both state, a lot of our federal state institutions exclude TED fund, those schools will collapse. If you go, you take a random data to study the infrastructural investment in particular state school from let's say 2000 to 2024. Or even 2023, let's say that's what I've extended. You find that virtually 90% of the, of the infrastructural, uh, this thing is, even in terms of capacity building for lecturers and even infusement of, in terms of research are largely funded by TED Fund. So this is what I'm telling you that the nature of the, uh, this thing, while we are supposed to be supporting, it has gone to the extent that at the federal level is now being overpowered mm. by so much work and the responsibility of even local government are pushed into to the federal government. For example, if you go to a rural village, when you see a secondary, a primary school mm. so dilapidated, the first thing is president has not done anything. People forget that the national policy of education says that is in the purview of the local government and the state government. But despite that, we also have to do ahead to ensure that we fill in a lot of gaps mm. so that the system will continue and the uh, uh, unhindered at okay. least at certain Level. Beautiful. Speaking of funding, uh, the student loan initiative is, uh, I think, five months old now. Uh, it's not domiciled in your ministry. It is uh, it responds, answers to the president directly. But your ministry is on the board of uh, the student loan initiative or managed by Nell Fund. Could you talk to us about the extent of implementation, especially considering um, the data that has been put out there by Nell Fund and the concerns that have arisen? Yes, we are in the board. And not only that, we are in the board. We are also the reporting ministry to the president. Nell Fund reports to the president through the Federal Ministry of Education. So we have a very cordial relationship with Nell Fund. And uh, we have been, uh, if there is any program as at today that is so transparent that you can track timeline, it's Nell Fund. That you cannot do away with that for, for them. Go to their website, you see how many students have so far applied, how many students at what level of their processing of their loan is, and how many have so far received both their personal and institutional grants, uh, institutional uh, mm -hmm. component of the loan. So it has been a, a decent. But what we really observe is that there is some, you know, the trust in governance. That's why the president came here, to, uh, came with, uh, come up with mission to renew the hope of operating Nigerians. That trust is not there. Initially, a lot of students thought it was just uh, a political statement without political will to implement it. But as today, it has been demonstrated. It's only not only political uh, uh, statement, but there is also a strong political will backed by a lot of legal uh, component of it to ensure that the uh, phone comes to reality and it's being accessed no. as of today. The other issue that we have also noticed in terms of that issue, uh, which we are addressing right now, is what I've mentioned, the Lucom attitude of some students. And Nelfon on its own as a body has started an advocacy level towards state, meeting so many stakeholders. They have been to many states in the north and the south. And uh, I think in the next few days, they are likely going to be either in Jigal well, State. Or maybe they're afraid of the repayment plan because that's also been described as enslavement, especially considering a country with, a, with soaring unemployment rates. Now, you're supposed to pay back this loan two years after completing your NYSC. Yes. If you're unable to pay because you don't have a job or a business, you're supposed to write and seek uh, extension. But do they say that you're going to be jailed? No, right. Well, I mean, those who have criticized it no, describe it as no, enslavement. See, that's how we're in so when you're done, when you take such a loan a, and you're done with school, you're trying to serve and then you're unable to pay. I'm not saying mm. it is either a good or a bad thing. I'm yes. saying how's the ministry taking that in and are there considerations to adjust uh, these concerns? You see, or is it there, there is nothing that says that once you did not pay and you are unable to pay, you are liable. But then how does it there affect no the fund? In that if, for example, if, for example, you have a backlog of debts, Yes. That have not been paid. How does the government you, continue to fund you see, something? It's just like assumption. That? Let us say now, right now, 
a lot of our school we must thank to the alumni association who have passed through the system. Just some few weeks ago, we are at the Federal Government Academy Sledger. And I've seen the, because of the impact of the project being undertaken by uh, alumni association, we have to give an extension of 10 days before resumption because they are, they are doing the total overhaul of virtually the school. And it's on record also, someone in Nigeria accessed loan in 1978 or so. And he kept it in his mind, just looking, looking for an opportunity. And with an establishment of NEL fund, he has paid that dues of almost 3 million, equivalent of what he has, he has calculated, equivalent to what he has accessed since 1978. This goes to show Nigerians are really their brother's keepers. Mm. And we cannot just think because people will not pay, will not will write up the benefit of that system. So what we are going to do as we are going, we are also instilling that discipline of nationhood, of uh, brothers keepers, so that they can realize that, look, in my life, along the line, through President Bola Ahmed Tunubu, Nelfon imparted positively to me, and I will be able to pay back my money. And not only be that, I will be the champion and alumni of Nelfon, and they will gather together also, utilize their distant ability and national reach also mm. pay back to the fund. I think that so the positive aspect of this is what we are capitalizing in. But we didn't say that if you, the law or the act did not mandate that if you cannot pay under any circumstances, you should be there. No. And I think this also ties to um, concerns around increase in school fees. There's a back and forth as to whether there is an increase in school fees. I don't know if you have a, a, a statement on that. Yes, yeah, yeah, so let me just say that uh, I've seen a lot in terms of uh, uh, writing that we have increased even at the, our Federal Unity College's school fees. That was not correct and that was not true. What happened was we have somebody who went, doctored the letter-headed paper of the Federal Ministry, uh, of education also doctored the signature of uh, the director secondary school education and issue a circular saying that the school fees has been increased from 100,000 for the first time to 386,000 plus which is entirely incorrect and it's a doctored uh, document and as a right now we are working with security agencies to to unveil who are the people behind that. At the same time, we have two major documents that were doctored from the Ministry of Education. We have a, a group that we are also in partnership with them. And those ones, the security agencies who are looking at the security implication of what they have done, is that to go ahead to say that we have issued a circular on the 2025 uh, school, Nigeria school debate. That Nigeria, we are proposing a topic that the uh, same-sex marriage should be legalized in Nigeria. Those ones, we have apprehended them, and the security is working on them. So okay. what I want to add this in is to say that, as, as today, the Federal Ministry of Education has not directed any school fees to be increased even by a single couple. Not across any level of education. Well, in the quarter, out across level of education is also, uh, you have to know that each university or each tertiary institution has its own uh, peculiarities that they are addressing. But we have also told them that whatever you are going to do must be in collaboration with major stakeholders. And who are the major stakeholders? The parent and also student union government of such institutions. There are other instances whereby school, in last year, school, uh, school fees were, 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 were introduced or increased without taking the necessary, uh, interest of the stakeholders, especially student union government. Mm -hmm. Now we have to, have, by then there wasn't a council. The ministry has to act on it. And those were addressed to meet the need of the student. Okay. And then let's also say, say that the issue of school fees as of today is only a problem to a student who wants it to be a problem to a tertiary level. Mm. Because we have institutional component of the, in the student loan fund, which you can access and will be paid directly to the school, not to you. So even if you are afraid, you can just take that one. You, some, you know, the major issue we have also realized is that because of COVID loan that is linked to BVF, Mm. Money is going into account of students is being, uh, they are, they are, they are, who access the loan have been, uh, have been deducted so that they can refund those loans. Yes. So that's what, one of the major issues. What I would say is, so, why, so, can't so you, what, 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 why can't you access the, is, the institutional component? Can, can, which will not come to your DC. Okay, so it goes directly to the school. Yes, it goes directly to the school. So it has nothing to hit your account. So that mm -hmm. you are not the, the fear that somebody will... So, so, uh, 
so we, this we individual this individual now owes for covid and then owes his uh, his education that's interesting but we have two things to talk about in yes. five minutes and i hope that we could quickly talk yes. about it and one of them is the age limit for admission into universities 18 years and it's generating quite a number of reactions some say that some children are smart enough to gain admission at 16, 17, or even 15. I know people who get PhDs in their 20s. Is this not a restriction? Well, I, I'm just happy that uh, as of today that Nigerians agree that uh, there is no debate on age for writing WAEC, NECO, mm. and uh, MBIS examination because we have already addressed that issue that it's not an issue that yeah. has come into fall. But for the issue of uh, age entry into university, I've also made it in different fora that yes, it arises, and it's a point of discussion, and it's a work on progress. Uh, work on progress in the sense that we are even invited and we are at the Federal uh, House of Representatives to make our position, which we said is just what is derived from the national policy on education that says that at age of six, you should enter your primary school. Uh, even at age of uh, three, you can be your primary school, pre-primary school level, and but at six, you should be in primary school, spend six years in primary school, go to basic education for another three years, and then that's junior secondary school, and then you now proceed to a secondary school at the age of uh, uh, for another three years. Mm. Then you proceed to university four or more years, depending so, on the So this, this policy so that is policy, adjustable. Yes, well, when that issue was rose, a lot of out, uh, outcry, and then a lot of interest developed. And we said, okay. That is good. We are now considering and looking at what people are saying. Mm. We do agree that there are exemptions. And the ministry is also looking at the possibility. Uh, we are working on to see how we can have uh, a policy document that will identify who are the talented students. You understand? Who can be given rare exceptional visa. Okay. And yes. then people will say, uh, outside country, even at the age of 10, 15, you can become a professor. Mm. But what you need to do in the United States, we are citing. We need to go and go good. Okay. What are the type of professors? So is just one, just one. Or more is this for <laughs> your professionalization? Just you one field that you took in your just, idea. Just one more thing. So before. we are working. But let me just put it. in. Let us wait. The National Council of Education is coming up in September. Okay. And with the resolution we have reached and the old finding we have had, we will be forwarded to the National Council of Education. Mm -hmm. We will now come with the national policy statement on that. All right. So just one more thing now. Um, the ban on Togo and Bene universities, the certificates. Can you talk to us about that? Because the concerns now are, uh, are, gender, are centered around why it is a blanket ban. Why not address the, the universities that are not accredited and deal with them? No, no, you see, it's not a, it's not a blanket ban. We didn't say all degrees from Togo, mm. Benin are not recognized. What we said, degrees from unaccredited institutions from Togo and Benin and any other place that we genuinely confirm is not accredited. Okay. It's not acceptable in Nigeria. And we have gone ahead, players, not what we have on social media platform. Okay. To get a document from Benin and Togo of the recognized university by that country. Okay. NUC has no right to accredit university in Togo. But NUC has equivalent body in Togo. Mm -hmm that also accredited your universities. And not what we see in social media. A lot of institutions in Nigeria that may not be recognized, if you go on social media, they can create a website to say that they are accredited. Okay. So we now say that we are not recognizing <laughs> any degree that is not recognized by Togo and the Republic as, an, uh, okay. as a degree awarding institution. Okay. And for Togo, they have only three Degree awarding institution, and for Benin, they have five. So, so that, any that, other, I, th I think that's also in debate because I know any that other qualification know, outside that, yeah, it's not acceptable. I think we will look into it's that not, eventually there's no because yeah, I let saw me tell no, you one thing. I, wait, wait, my wait, institutions wait. at a certain stage in Nigeria. I was I, uh, no, we're, uh, we're out of time. I was going to respond oh. to the, the 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 number of institutions that you say are accredited. Yes, because I think there was a, the stakeholder, education stakeholders in Benin Republic responded saying that there were more than three and five in Togo and Benin, as you had put it. But, but we are looking also what was given to us. Okay, I think your minister will probably look into it. Yes. But I'd like to say a very big yes, thank, thank you to you, uh, Honorable Yusuf Sununu. Thank you very much for coming yeah, on. Thank you for having me. All right, I've been speaking with the Honorable Minister of. Uh, State for Education, Honorable Yusuf Sununu. We'll take a break now. When we come, we'll turn our attention to the Edo elections. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to Political Paradigm. Let's now turn our attention to the Edo State Governorship election, which is just days away. I'm joined by an entrepreneur, a businessman, a philanthropist, a software engineer, as he is as well, who is into some blockchain development. I'm joined by Dr. Bright and Nabulele, who is listed as the deputy governorship candidate of the Accord Party on the INEC website, but he insists that he is the governorship candidate of the party. Dr. Enabulele, welcome to Political Paradigm. Before we go into... Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, you're most welcome. Before we go into party politics, uh, I'd like to ask you this quick question. It's election week in Edo State. What's the atmosphere like with regard to concerns around violence that have trailed this election? Well, when you look at the environment in our land today, you can tell that the state is in deep crisis, uh, that the problem in Edo is bigger than every all political party, whether it's, SD, uh, whether it's PDP, APC, Accord, Labour. What is missing now in our land is a man that can unite the state, and a man that can have an idea that can create a civilized and expose administrations that we unite all the party and transcend beyond party line. This is what is missing uh, because uh, the, the party, PDP, APC, uh, I look at the rally, no one actually tell the people what they're going to do for them. All they focus on is how they're going to defend themselves when there's war. And that's not what they don't want right now. We don't want to be at war. I, uh, if you witness the global crisis around the world today, especially in Gaza, you can tell that war is not good for anyone. I'm very particular about the security situation because, you know, there was a peace accord signing. Uh, while it may be synonymous or traditional with our elections these days, it's uh, quite peculiar with the Edo situation considering the violence that has trailed this election. And you find that the PDP even said they wouldn't sign uh, that peace accord because of concerns around neutrality of the police or otherwise. That's why I started off by asking you, what do you think about the security situation in the state? And if as a party or as a uh, candidate in that election, you feel comfortable going into that election, which is just days away, by the way. And also perhaps speaks to the neutrality claim by the police. The IGP has promised that the police will stay neutral. First of all, we must love ourselves. And we must have faith. And we must have also uh, hope that everything will be okay. I don't want to go into this election with no certainty. Then that will scare everybody away. Because at the end of the day, it's all about what we think in our mind. Uh, when I look at the entire atmosphere in that door, uh, it's these two parties, big political parties, uh, that are creating this fear in all our mind today. Uh, whether it's APC and PDP, they are not the only party that's contesting this election. And they're not the only one that have knowledge to go on at those states. I mean, uh, four years, we have given them chance uh, to rule our people, to lead our people. Uh, Basically, was four years in APC, I was four years in PDP. Uh, I know I, I, in America, we also practice autocracy. For me, we must respect democracy and not autocracy. Okay, so, so you are not worried about the violence concerns ahead of the elections? I like to think so from your statement. I, I think it's going to be peaceful. Beautiful. That's good uh, to know. Did you, did you sign, did your party sign the peace accord? I was the first to sign. My party is number one on the ballot. So I was the first to sign. So it was you who signed it? Yes. Okay, that, that's interesting. I, I, I'd like us to pick up from there and go into party politics, considering the controversy with the, within your party. Um, for many people, they would probably be surprised that you signed that because on the INEC website, it is uh, Iere Kennedy that's listed as a governorship candidate and you are the deputy governorship candidate. And I know that you parried yourself as the governorship candidate of the Accord Party. So perhaps you could explain the situation here. I don't know about um, that controversy. Uh, this uh, ticket is a joint ticket. Uh, we have an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, we look at the Edo uh, State today, you will look at the entire atmosphere. You will, uh, the candidate is nowhere to be found. And I think uh, on the day of the elections, I think uh, people should look carefully. I don't know even the least or whatever is there, but I think uh, 
I am the candidate of the party on I think. Maybe on the day of the elections, maybe the system, I don't know. If he has been updated, there may be some misconceptions. But for me, um, um, it's, it's a joint ticket. I'm happy to be on the race with him. But uh, at the end of the day, a lion is never scared to walk alone. Because the problem for Edo State is bigger than our party. Uh, so for me, the party understand, the people of Edo State understand who their candidate is, who's fighting for them, who's on ground, who's promoting. Uh, for I, I, I mean, I, this is not about uh, naive or, or try to compete. For me, it's about moving Edo State forward. But I came into this race, I have one reason. Uh, to compete and not only to be uh, someone that's coming up second, to come and take over our Southern Bay House. Our land is in deep crisis. And for me, I believe that uh, we need a civilized and exposed administrations. With my experience around the globe, I think I'm the new hope of Edo State. I would like some clarification, and I'm sure the people of Edo State will like it as well, because you say that on Saturday, the people of Edo State will know who to vote for. You've talked, I've raised the controversy within your party, saying that Eric Kennedy is listed as the governorship candidate of the Accord Party, while you, Dr. Brighton Ablele, uh, listed as the deputy governorship candidate, but you say you are the governorship candidate, I believe. And then you also say that the candidates, uh, Mr. Yeri Kennedy is nowhere to be found. Could you explain that and also explain how you emerged as the candidate of the Accord Party, just to put this controversy to rest, perhaps? I mean, uh, I have had situations where we did our primary, it was a joint ticket. At that time, he announced me as his deputy. But you know, the INEC always make provisions as the election going uh, to substitute and also to make provisions to switch if someone felt like they are no longer uh, interested in running the race. Uh, for me, I don't look at the race as a competition. I look at me and Kennedy area as a joint ticket. So fortunate, I can't control human behavior. Uh, this is not a power struggle. This is not a power tussle. Uh, the people of Edo understand who their candidate is for a court party and who has been on ground to work for them. And uh, I have not looked at the list of INEC, but when I look at the list of INEC, I know my name is there. Uh, so I don't know. If yeah, as deputy different... governorship candidate, that's my emphasis. <laughs> yes, I'm the governor. No, I mean, on yes. INEC's website, you're listed as deputy governorship candidate. Well, then you talked about substitution, which is definitely allowed. But when was the substitution made and by whom? Because I remember that the chairman of your party in the state had insisted that the governorship candidate of your party uh, is um, Yere Kennedy. Was he the one who substituted your name? Yes. The party, there's a, there's a right for them to uh, substitute and uh, make provision for that. Uh, when I talked to my partner, I call it my partner because it was a joint ticket. Uh, we have a member of understanding for me to run as a governorship candidate in another party. I mean, since we did the primaries and in a door state, uh, a year has never been here been in the city. I mean, in some way it makes whole life in a, on a bull job and talks about different things. I don't want to focus more on that because at the end of the day, it's a joint ticket. We want our court to come out and win. And on the days of the election, if our court wins, uh, the INEC has the right to, uh, to announce who the candidate of our court party is. So who's it? Uh, so yes. If I'm the candidate, it will be announced live. And that's what we are waiting for. Two things. Uh, two to things. Two, two things so that we can leave this conversation uh -huh. of your party uh, yes. politics. Because that's for me, it's a, it's a distraction. Because Well, well very, very, you, you imagine how the voters feel about it as well. You know, all the, all the voters care about right now is Dr. Nabil Lady Accord Party. Oh, so you, that's, that's the momentum in the door. Look at all the bay boards, look at everywhere. Okay. Uh, if it was all about India, if, it, if it was all about Kennedy, we're out of the race. So you say that is not. So, so you say he's a, is, you say there's no conflict. He's out of the race willingly. No, you I, mean, have... I said if it was about Kennedy, yeah. mean, who will I be out of the race? It's not about Kennedy. Right? It's about a court party. That's beautiful. I, I, no, I, well, this is political. It's, it's about Dr. Bright. It's about Dr. Bright and Abilene. Well, this is political paradigm. So the politics of things have to uh, come come in first. So, so I just want... the people are going to go to INEC. They're not <laughs> going to see my. They're going to see a court party. Beautiful. And they're going to vote a court. Oh, that, yes. that's beautiful. So, 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 so a court party, and the ANEC is going to announce <laughs> a court party, Dr. Bright and Abolele, as the new governor of Edo State, and then we'll take it from there. So, who's your running mate? 
I just Kennedy Yeary. I have no problem yeah. with Kennedy Yeary. What I have a problem with is a crisis in Edo State right now. Beautiful. And people go into this election for many reasons. I didn't go into this election for personal gain. I came to transform the land. Uh, most of this big party has failed us, and I want to still focus on that. Uh, mm-hmm. We have not had since the since the manifesto of Abu Sali that was about 41 years ago. The state has not moved forward. I, I'm not here to run the politics of redress or retribution. When you look at the land for the past 24 years, uh, people have been asking for clean water. They have been asking for electricity. They have been asking for good roads. Those are social issues. Those are something that are necessity. Those are not laws. If we cannot address social issues, how do we deal with critical infrastructures and skyscrapers? For me, I want to go to politics 101, economy. My goal in coming to this race today is to say, look, allow the knowledgeable, put the right people in the right position, and the country will go forward. Absolutely. What we're suffering in Nigeria today, what we're suffering in Nigeria today, but we'll put the wrong people at the right place and the right people in the wrong place. There's going to be, you know, I'm in the state. We don't want to force democracy on anyone. If we force democracy on anyone, it's going to be anarchy. That's not what we're looking in this state today. Uh, I could not talk about de- I could not talk about PDP. I can't talk about APC. I can't talk about labor because I cannot defend the Senate in command. I run on that accord because I understand it's a fresh plate. We have not destroyed the land. We have not caused any mishap. So for me, the people should vote wisely. I was just endorsed yesterday by the Social Democratic Party as their candidate, because this is a time where all the people come together and say enough is enough of this of this uh, bad governance, of this economic sabotage. Is this endorsement by the um, SDP uh, your arrangement or with your party? Well, it's, they, are, they came, it's just a joint. They came and said, look, we like your manifesto. We like what you're doing. And we don't want another four years of suffering in that door. We're going to adopt you. We're going to endorse you as a, as, a, as a candidate of a court. And we want to make sure that everybody, all SDP in Edo State, go on that day on September 21st and vote for you. From the three senatorial districts. So basically, it, it's your, your party. Your party is not aware of this alliance. Yeah, no, they're aware. Of, 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 course, of course, they're aware. Okay, beautiful. Aware. Uh, you, know, you know, some um, political watchers believe that track records play a great role in a person's uh, political journey. And uh, many would want to know where, where you're coming from. I've heard you say you came into the country, you came into the country to adjust things and make them what they should be. Uh, so I think everyone would want to know what your, politi- what your political history is like and your public service record, if you do have any. Or perhaps I know you're an entrepreneur and how that you know, comes in to, uh, to help your cause in this race. Uh, first of all, I'm not, a, I'm not a typical politician. I'm a technocrat. Uh, when you use the word politician, it just make the thing looks like we're here to deceive the people. I'm not a politician. I'm a technocrat. And we look at offshores, beyond our shores. We, the democracy, we adopt democracy from the Western culture. And uh, we're still struggling with the rule of law. And every great thing that happens in this land today is most of the knowledge of foreign. I've traveled, I moved around the world. I was born in Edo State. I went to high school. I attended Edo College. So I was granted. So traveling around the world, I believe only the diaspora can repair Edo State. Because you cannot give what you don't have. A man that has never had, uh, a man that has never uh, experienced or interrupted a power supply cannot give a power supply. A man that has never tasted clean water can never give you clean water. A man that has never ride on good road can never give you good road. So what are we fighting for here? We want development. We want our state to move forward. We want foreign investment. I can challenge the state anywhere in the world across the globe. I believe Dr. Brighton now believe it's exposed, civilized, and also have the knowledge to move the state forward. Uh, the Labour Party, the PDP, the uh, APC, the Accord Party, the PROP, all the political political party. The problem of a dual state is bigger than all of them. We must have a check and balance in our executive branch, not only on the legislature. Because you see people going to this place that think it's an authoritarian. Democracy should be democratic and should have power spread around all up to the grassroots. But when the governor goes into that power, you just believe that it's authoritarian, running a terror government, and people start thinking it's only one governor that controls everything. No, we have the federal, we have the state, and we have the local government. The problem here is we fail to reestablish the rule of law. And I repeat that again. If you are the one that creates the law, 
And you are the one that established that it appraised the law. And you are the one that enforced the law. We must obey the law. We cannot move forward if we don't respect the rule of law. And that's where it's This is a great country. Um, you've spoken so well about the decay in governance in those states. I would like you to look at those states from 1999 since the return to democracy and address concerns around the development within just Benin City, which is the capital of Edo State. And uh, those who have said that Edo State has not experienced development beyond Benin City. So what are your detailed plans to expand development beyond Benin City to other parts of Edo State? Uh, uh, listen, I am not here to wrong the politics of retribution or redress. I'm not saying that Obasaki has not done well or Shumule has not done well. Uh, the, key, the key here is you cannot give what you don't have. They have done their best. I'm happy that the state is not on fire. That's great for me. That means the state can move forward. All I'm just saying, the government should change hands. The people look at administrations, I just thought about. Obasaki said, well, I, I build education back. I have to do this, I do text. I am not there. I'm not a media people to check, prove that. But when you come into the land, there are three things that the people have been asking for. I'm ashamed in 21st century that we are still campaigning on social issues like water and power and electricity. For the past 24 years, you know, I remember the manifesto of Abrisoli 41 years ago, 1983. That government was a government that I could remember that says equality for all, education, industrialization, community and farming. That brings our people together. Today, no government will be able to fulfill that promises. I want to stand on that existing manifesto that I say, I'm coming to the place and unite the people. How do you unite the people when there's hunger in the land? We have to engage our people. We need social services. We need public services. Our government should be able to have welfare assistance for our people. We have the funding. If we control mismanagement of funds within the government, corruptions and forced labor, paying people that are not on payroll, we should be able to take care of our people. We're only 4.7 million people. At least 3 million people are viable. What was the last time the government says, look, I am going to make sure after the pandemic that I do to get 100,000 euros as citizens. We want to circulate our economy. Don't forget, capitalisms are built on the private sector, not on the public sectors. When you neglect the private sectors, the economy is going to fall. And it's not the government. The people first, because the people elect you. The powers are vested on the people to elect their leaders. Dr. And at the same time, protect them. The question we're having in a dual state today, we can say all this grammar that we want. We can make all these promises. When the government don't respect the rule of law, the people will not respect you. And when the government don't prioritize the needs of the people first, they're going to be a Russia in our land. Hmm. Let's care for the people. Dr. We Nabil. have lands, we have culture. Let's engage our people correctly. I'm curious. Uh, thank you for coming on this platform to talk to your people. But I also want to know how else you're communicating with your people. <clears throat> Do you have a manifesto? Uh, and have you been able to go around the states like the other political parties have done to speak to people directly? You're asking me, I just repeat, I'm standing on the existence of the manifesto of Abrisoli. That was abandoned 41 years ago. Free education, early childhood education, when I look at Edo State, from the age of 16 to 15, 11% of our children drop out of school. Those are the times that we need education the most. Education should not be a priority or a responsibility of our parents because our children are going to give back to us in the future. I remember when I was growing up, I was having free books. When was the last time this administration and the past administration gave books to the students? That's what I'm saying. I'm not here to run the politics of retribution. I'm not here to condemn Obasaki. He has done well for the people according to their own satisfaction. No, my, but my, for me, my, my question, I am not satisfied. My question, I am not satisfied. Beautiful. My question yes. was more about how you're passing this message across to your people. The election is this week, and we've seen campaigns from the APC, the PDP, and the Labour Party. They've gone just about all across the state. We haven't seen yours, so I'm wondering if your people are as aware as you put it. Of course. Uh, we're on ground. I went to the northern part. I went to the southern part. I'm in a do state campaigning. Uh, they are aware of our court party, but sometimes they want to engage all these big channels so we don't have a chance. And I'm happy to know that you guys gave us opportunity to understand that uh, it's not only these big parties that are running. One of the things you talked about is um, that 
politics is not just about the APC, the PDP, or the Labour Party at all. And some would say that, considering the success of the Labour Party in uh, the 2023 general elections, that they would expect the smaller parties like yours to rally behind the Labour Party, form alliances, form mergers, whatever you can come up with, to be able to oust the APC and the PDP that have been in power in your state since 1999. I just told you, uh, SDP, I produced a governor in the state, Oyegun. They endorsed me yesterday because they saw the future. I have two other parties that are talking to me uh, because alliance is the greatest competition. The endorsement should not be about party, it should be about character. Someone that can move the state forward. That's what matters. We need a civilized administration. I remember when we were showing Iran, ACN was not a big party in the third state. We gave him a chance to become our governor because we believe that there was a deep crisis. And we are in the same situation again after 16 years. So for me, I believe Dr. Nabila now should be given a chance. Because at the end of the day, I told him, you don't need a dictionary to translate on. The world is watching from everywhere. We're in a global village. The world is becoming a global village. In time, you can see Akuku Edo from anywhere. You can see Owan from anywhere. You can get data and statistics. The people are in my heart, not on the land. Look at Malaysia. Let's forget about Europe. They are far from us. Look at Bangladesh, Nepal, Vietnam. Go to their places. They are not as wetty as us, but their system, their social issues are taken care of. Even in Gaza, there's electricity. Even in Gaza, there's water. No, I'm not telling you that uh, I am the Omega, but I'm telling you with intelligence, the right minds and the right people in government and build the right institutions, our state will move forward. That's beautiful. Uh, we're almost out of time now, but I want to quickly ask you this question. Uh, you've you're doing the unconventional campaign style, which is quite commendable if you're really reaching to your people, reaching out to your people one on one. Oh, at least they are listening now. They are listening uh, to me now. Yes, beautiful. Yeah. How's that coming up for you? How how campaigns so far, especially from someone that they may not consider to be popular? I'm not sure how long you've been in the country or when you joined the Accord Party, but popularity is a uh, is a game that's played in Nigeria when it comes to politics. We are here to change the status quo. Popularity has not led us anywhere. We need an intelligent mind, a civilized administration, which is send the right narrative to the people that at the end of the day, it's not about popularity. It's about someone that has the people, someone that understands humanity, someone that understands love, a man with good character. So I don't care about popularity. I care about a man that can do the job and unite the people. When Abu Salih came to this country, he came from the foreign country. And today, his manifesto has never been defeated. And no one has fulfilled that promise. And I promise you, I will fulfill the promise. I will fulfill the manifesto of Abu Salih that was abandoned 41 years ago. That talks about early child education, free education for all, increase our farming, our farming. Look at the hunger in our land. We are importing grains from Ukraine. Just one second. The reason, the reason I asked about popularity is this. If you've spent so much time outside this country... How no, my heart is here. One second. My heart one, one has second. always been, one second. I am a Pan-Africanist. Beautiful. How familiar could you possibly be with the state of things in the country? Are you from Benin? I'm from Edo. I was born in Benin. Beautiful. So let's say you go to a place called Aochi. How familiar are you with the challenges experienced in Aochi? So we have, we have our wards, we have our party chairmen, we have our ward chairmen, and they bring this information. I will be the first governor. I will set a premier standard to be the first governor to turn the 18 local government and see what is missing in that land and come back and summon all the local government chairman and say, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you will face challenges and face the constitutional consequence. Problem here is when you put the wrong people in the right place uh, and the Dr. right people in the wrong right place, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a problem in our land. Thank you so much. Dr. Brighton Abulele, I'd like to thank you for coming on Political Paradigm. And... Um, I appeal to you and the political class to ensure that it's safe. So speak to your people as well to avoid violence. <laughs> no, it's going to be peaceful. Beautiful. Are, listen, Edo is going to be peaceful. All those things are just uh, just to scare people oh, it's, away. It's, We're going to have I, a peaceful I, I, I didn't mention this. It's my state as well. So I'm very concerned about... Oh, you're from Edo? <laughs> Absolutely. You're from Edo. So I'm Thank happy you. to have me in channel. God bless you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, I've been speaking with Dr. Bright and Abulele, who is uh, listed on the INEC website as the deputy governorship candidate of the Accord Party in the forthcoming Edo governorship election. But he insists that he is the governorship candidate and his name has been substituted now by his party. If you'd like to catch this interview and the previous one, please go to channelstv.com or go to YouTube and search Political Paradigm. I'm Terry Ikumi. Goodbye.